The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone out there in virtual performance group land. I uh, hope you are having a wonderful February day. Um, we are kicking off our February session today with um, a couple gurus out of SolarWinds. So very excited to have them today. So we will dive into just a quick kickoff here. So my name is Leslie Weed, uh, president of Virtual Performance Group. If you would like to be part of the group and help uh, wrangle speakers and do all that good stuff, just let me know. Uh, Twitter, hashtag, website, discussion list, and email are all listed here. You can also find us through pass.org if you want to contact us. All right. If you are new to GoToWebinar, we do suggest maximizing your screen. There is no call-in number. This is VoIP only. Um, if you have any issues, though, raise your hand or chat with me privately, and I will answer your questions through chat. For questions today, um, just go ahead and enter your questions. We're not going to answer them till the end of the session, so but you can enter those questions at any time. Okay, past Summit 2020 this year, right? Uh, Texas. So Houston, Texas, November 10th through the 13th. Uh, there is an early bird registration. I have not received the group discount code yet. I expect to get that this month, I believe. Um, so I, I will track that down. And as soon as I have that, I will get that up on the website through pass.org. All right, so a few upcoming SQL Saturdays. I know there's a lot out there and I know there's a lot of webinars going on through the virtual group. So hopefully you guys look at pass.org on a fairly regular basis to see what's going on. And of course, just a reminder that PASS does have a career center site you can go check out. Um, and a couple different ways to work with PASS. So hopefully everybody has their membership with pass.org so you do get those emails and newsletters and access to the website. All right, a big thank you to our sponsor, SolarWinds. They have sponsored us with many, many years, um, including this year. And so one of you lucky attendees today will get a $200 gift card. So must be present to win today. <laughs> so we will send out notification to that lucky winner, post the webinar um, and get you set up with that. Uh, but a big thank you to SolarWinds because they allow us to do some really neat things within the community. Um, okay, so our presenters today from SolarWinds, uh, Carlo and John, they're going to introduce themselves. They're going to go over performance tuning with machine learning. Very excited to have you all with us today. Really appreciate it. Um, this will be a lot of fun. So this is being recorded, and we will have this up afterwards. So I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to John and Carlo here. Let me. Make sure I get the right presenter. There we go. Uh, so John, you do have presentation mode now and you should be good to go. Okay, great, thanks Leslie. Um, hi everybody, uh, my name is John Maxwell. I am a, a product marketing manager here at SolarWinds on our database tools. And Carlo Z Carlo Z Zatelny, <laughs> I just, Zatelny. Zatelny, he's yeah. sitting right here. Um, he, this is really great that we have Carlo here because he is our uh, director of architecture here at SolarWinds, and he really has been driving the machine learning. Um, and to have basically kind of the, the father of machine learning here at SolarWinds on this uh, webcast is really great. So ask, ask, ask him your hardest question, not, not me, but um, what we're gonna do is we're keeping this you know, casual. Um, we're, we're gonna kind of go through uh, a quick overview of SolarWinds and the product, just so you understand what the product is, and then we're going to get into kind of the guts of machine learning, kind of give you a history of how we added to the product, why we added to the product, how it works, uh, and kind of where we're going from here, because we've now had machine learning in the product for just right at a little over a year. Um, and, and again, we'll just keep it very casual. You guys can, uh, we'll, what we'll do is we'll just save, because I, I know we're gonna have plenty of time. Uh, we'll save the end of the webcast to go in and uh, you know do Q and A, answer whatever questions you have. Also, uh, SolarWinds will be at PASS in Houston, which is great for us living here in Austin because it's literally a drive, we won't even have to fly. So we look forward to seeing all of you um, 
in Houston this year for the uh, for the Big Pass show. So with that said, uh, one of the reasons why I kind of put this overview of solar winds is, and thank you to everyone who participated in the survey. I was a little shocked at how many people part of the uh, virtual performance pass group had never heard of solar winds, uh, and or if they heard of solar winds, they didn't know that we are in you know the database segment for database performance management. So you know, solar winds is company headquartered here in Austin, Texas, uh, publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange (SWI). Uh, just celebrated our 20-year anniversary. Uh, we're I, you know I, I think on target to hit you know close to a billion dollars revenue. Um, and our focus really is, um, you know, uh, performance monitoring management really across uh, the stack. I mean, a lot of people know of SolarWinds um, from network performance monitoring, uh, which according to IDC, we're number one from a market share perspective in. But, you know, what SolarWinds has done over time is really expanded beyond just network performance monitoring. And this is, I, I like this chart because it really does kind of at a very high level. I mean, we have around 70 different uh, products that we offer both SaaS and uh, on-prem based. And, you know, we span, um, you know, on-premise applications, of course, you know, up into the cloud. Um, you know, we have applications, uh, APM products, application performance monitoring, database products, which is where my focus is. Um, and then we kind of get into, you know, server storage, you know, the networking I, I mentioned. And then we also have uh, a uh, industry leading ITSM solution uh, product. And then you can kind of see off to the right, um, we've uh, now been expanding into the security space uh, for, for security type solutions. So today we're talking about database performance analyzer, which was the is so far the first product. But I know from talking to Carl, there's going to be other products um, within the portfolio that are implementing machine learning. And so I just wanted to give you a overview of what uh, database performance analyzer is, just so you know the product. Especially when we go into the section where we're going to uh, walk through some aspects of the product and actually show you what the machine learning looks like. So database performance analyzer which we just kind of since that's kind of a mouthful we, we call it dpa uh, it is a product that's been around for 10 years uh, started out in oracle and added sql server and we now support seven uh, on-premise and uh, cloud platforms with a, a new one coming out next quarter um, with additional platform coverage from a database perspective um, but what we're focused on is really cross-platform so we support, like I said, seven database platforms on premises in the cloud. And what we're known for is our weight analysis. And that's so you can go into the product and find out the, the root cause for, uh, you know, what is causing performance degradation within a database instance tied to a specific uh, application or, you know, the SQL query. Um, our query level analysis is, is really our forte because we give you kind of an all-in-one view uh, that gives you a, a profile of, of the, the query itself. We show you everything, all the inefficiencies from the SQL itself to, um, you know, the table, um, which allow you to go look, in, uh, look at the, uh, the plan, kind of we blow that out. Um, we have you know all kinds of blocking information deadlocking for sql server and then we show you all the um metrics you know like consumption cpu disk all of that along with what's going on internally within the uh the, the sql query um something that's kind of unique with the product that we've had in the past year and a half is expert tuning advice so we'll actually go in and tell you um, how you can optimize the query, how you can optimize the table, um, everything from just us looking at the activity to pinpoint issues to giving you advice on kind of industry best practices. Uh, the next webcast that SolarWinds is going to sponsor, which is in April, is really going to hone in on virtualization, so I won't talk a lot about that, but we have um, built into the product, we have in-depth um, virtualization monitoring since so many databases now um, that we just did a poll 
a couple of weeks ago and um, roughly 80% of the respondents had 50% or more of their databases running in virtual machines. So, uh, you know, that's important from a DB perspective to know if, if you're having performance issues, you know, do you, is it because of virtualization or can you rule that out? And then, you know, like going back to those initial slides that I had that talked about solar winds, you know, solar winds really does, I know it's a cliche, but we do have end-to-end -end performance monitoring. If you look at from, you know, the network aspect with our NPM product to server with our SAM server and application monitor down into virtualization, storage, um, and, and of course here the, the the database aspect database performance analyzer but all these products you know solarwinds has invested a lot of money into creating a architecture called orion that allows the products to work off of kind of a common uh base and allow the products to communicate with each other share data with each other and present it from a single pane of glass view and there's a couple interesting um applications that is you know, you basically, once you buy one of the uh, SolarWinds products, then you got another one. You can use these two features. One's called AppStack and one's called PerfStack. And what they do is they allow you to literally from, say, one, uh, you know, you're looking at primarily, say, it's server um, health or, or, or a database instance running on, you know, a server, my, all of my SQL running on certain Windows machines. Uh, you can then stack that up and then bring in data from another part of the product. So, for example, if you wanted to stack up, you know, from a server perspective, um, the servers that are handling your SQL Server databases, then line up the data from Database Performance Analyzer and then line up uh, storage information from the physical storage, you can do all of that. So, it's kind of a, a cool feature and, and that's why we have, I believe SolarWinds now is close to 300,000 if we haven't really uh, gone over the 300,000 mark as far as the number of customers worldwide. So a lot of our customers use multiple products because of this uh, Orion integration. So Database Performance Analyzer uh, does 24-7 real-time uh, data collection down to the second. It's agentless, so there is no software to install on um, the server that's, that's running the database instance, uh, the virtual machine, or if, you have, if you're running the cloud. What we do is we, I've literally done this a million times or it feels like a million times where you go in, you install the product and then you just basically register the databases that you want. And then we basically just uh, log in from a read perspective to collect the data. And, you know, we're, we just uh, kind of celebrated a, a, a milestone where we're monitoring now over 100,000, 100,000 database instances worldwide through our customers. And since the technology is is you know um, you know solid the, with that agentless architecture, we, we you know there's basically nominal overhead one percent or less to get that 24/7 down to the second granularity. The reason why I call out the down to the second is is you guys. No, from you know either built-in performance products or you maybe use some real competitors. A lot of products collect data at you know 10 second intervals, 20 second intervals, and if you're in a high volume or you have you know fast running queries, you're going to actually miss a lot of data. So we feel like that collecting the data down to the second gives us an advantage uh, because we can then you know see those transactions, see data see you know transactions that may run thousands or in some of our customers instances millions of times during a 24 hour period and and then actually do kind of weight level analysis and look for inefficiencies at, at a bigger perspective because you may say oh, well that you know i have these transactions that run so quick why is it an issue but if you cumulatively look at them maybe they're they're being ineffective because there's um you know some in index changes you need to make to the table or you need to you've got some issues that you didn't realize from a, a server or virtual machine perspective so what i've got here listed on the screen are the databases that we support today and i didn't go through all the iterations of the cloud so so for example uh you know we support oracle oracle x data oracle e-business oracle sc oracle enterprise edition for sql server which i think is you know, probably based on the survey that we did, 100% uh, of the audience today has got SQL Server. 
we support everything from, in fact, what's kind of cool, we support a SQL Server 2019 day one. So we always try to stay very current, but uh, we, we've we supported, for example, since 2017, Azure SQL database. And we uh, announced, uh, ironically, right at the, the same week of pass last year, the support for Azure SQL uh, database managed instance. So, you know, broad support, we support uh, SQL Server uh, running in, you know, RDS. Um, so, you know, broad cloud support uh, through both um, um, Azure, and in fact, if you go into the Azure marketplace and type in database performance analyzer, you can very easily spin up uh, DPA in the Azure cloud as long as you have your own uh, license. So it's kind of a BYOL, where if you have your own license keys, you can then easily Hi, John, you just, your speaker just went out right at about the time you were talking about the license key. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so yeah, what I was mentioning with, with the, the BYOL with uh, Azure is as long as you have a license, and, and what's kind of cool with our product is uh, we, we have basically floating licenses. So you buy, let's say, 50 licenses for uh, DPA from us, uh, you know, if you're running SQL Server on-prem and then all of a sudden you move your workloads to Azure, then just, you know, once you move the workload, then use those keys to monitor your Azure SQL Server. There, Because I, I know some vendors will like tie your license keys to a server or to a specific implementation. We don't do that. As, as long as, um, you know, once you, you purchase them, you, you, you own them. Uh, what I was going to mention with Amazon, we're a little different in that we run as a subscription and there's really no, it's not like a professional license. You basically uh, pay for what you use. Uh, again, this just shows the architecture I already kind of talked about, which is agentless. You can install us in a virtual machine on premise in the cloud, um, either on a Linux host or a Windows host. And then you see here under repository database, um, you can choose, you know, SQL Server, of course, and some other databases that you want to store your data in. So we, by default, will store up to a year's worth of data. Uh, we have a lot of customers in the e-commerce space that collect like a two and three years worth of data. Because once we kind of talk, um, Carlo gets into some of the discussion about machine learning, he's going to talk about seasonality, and uh, which is really key into learning um what your applications you know look like um and and then kind of you know the predicting creating intelligent baseline so with that um i am going to turn get into this part of the presentation carlo why don't you take it from here and uh carlo will go through his slides and then we'll go into the product excellent thank you so let me be clear first of all uh, what we want to do at SolarWinds when it comes to machine learning uh, oftentimes Throughout my tenure here at SolarWinds, I've been approached by different marketing people who want to use machine learning just as a catchphrase or a buzzword to put on the website, and uh, I'm not big on that. I'm really into the actual machine learning parts of it and using it to solve specific problems. So when it comes to SolarWinds products, what we look to do with our machine learning is solve specific problems for customers that solve things in their day-to-day -day uh, environment that they're working with. So that's the problem that we're trying to solve. When when we bring machine learning into a product that SolarWinds, there needs to be a question that we're answering. And so hopefully, as I explain all of this, you'll be able to see that that's been the goal and will continue to be the goal of our different products. For DPA specifically, we chose the wait time because what we found in talking to our customers is that Wait time is a key indicator because if your queries are running slow, then your application or your website is running slow. So because of that, it's been really key for a lot of customers to watch that metric and understand when things are going wrong. However, because of the way that databases work, that metric is very volatile in that it will bounce up and down throughout the day, throughout the week, uh, over time, in not always a predictable or consistent way and what's high at one point might not be 
considered high at another point and vice versa. So we wanted to bring in some machine learning to see if we could use it to actually learn uh, what are the patterns of everybody's environment and would it be able to accurately give more uh, or better alerting to our customers rather than just the traditional methodologies. So let's take a look at those traditional methodologies. So most products that you'll buy on the market today will have just the static threshold uh, methodology where you'll say, all right, if this specific metric goes over some specific threshold, then trigger the alert and send the email or do whatever action is um, appropriate for that. And you can do other things like set blackout times and do time of day uh, functionality and just send it to the right recipients based off of whether it's happening during work hours or during uh, nights and weekends. And that works pretty well for uh, a lot of well understood metrics or well understood workloads. It's not great for highly adaptive things and environments that are going up and down with different people around the world with different schedules then the static thresholds start to really fall short. Adaptive monitoring is one step better, I think, in that it's using a variety of methods in order to give somebody a better look at what's going on and not just use one static number for uh, triggering the al alarms, but instead using some uh, fancy math as is on the slide in order to determine what's actually going on and be more reactive or understanding of what's uh, happening in that specific environment. It's better because it's actually looking at your data as a customer versus uh, doing something based off of static thresholds that are just based off of maybe more uh, well understood numbers throughout the industry instead of saying, all right, for you, we're gonna look at a, a sliding window or other, other time-based metric to say, all right, what's going on, how do we baseline it, and then run some statistical calculations like mean and standard deviation, and then do some uh, reasonable assumptions to say, all right, here's your special number for your specific uh, time period, and then do alerting off of that. That works pretty well, uh, but it also has its weaknesses. It will uh, tend to not understand specific seasonal components of the data. So if there's a well understood seasonal component where there's uh, definite nights and weekends or daily spikes or vacation days and other things like that, it doesn't always react quickly enough or it doesn't understand overall trends. And so the, the baselines, while they do well for some data, uh, we found that really when it comes to wait time in databases, the adaptive monitoring, just the, the static or dynamic baseline methodology was also insufficient. It didn't capture all the nuances that tend to happen in customer environments and just wasn't satisfying the need that we we're really looking to solve for our customers, that we really wanted to give them that true anomaly detection experience and really reduce the noise of uh, false positives. All right, now for the exciting part of the show. So what did we actually do? Um, we introduced machine learning and uh, if you Google machine learning and you want to know what's the difference between machine learning and predictive analytics or machine learning and AI and all of those different things, uh, what is the difference? So to us, machine learning is doing something that's model based. So it's looking at the data and actually generating a model in a way that it will be able to do something that is otherwise not easily done by a person, but ultimately could be done by a person. If you spent enough uh, time doing it, you could come up with this answer, but it's just, it crunches so many numbers so quickly to generate the model that you just, it's not practical for any person or group of people to actually do it. Predictive analytics just looks at certain trends within the data and tries to predict based off of those trends and based off of statistical models, but doesn't take into other things that uh, when you throw machine learning algorithms at it, the machine learning algorithms are better 
at working out uh, different nuances within the data and looking for multiple levels of seasonality and different variations in order to actually be able to see what's going on in the data and how does it actually then adapt the algorithm in order to uh, find what is a true anomaly versus what is something that just might be uh, a false positive. All right, so I'll explain the algorithm a, a little bit in more detail. Uh, we had a lot of requirements that we wanted to satisfy coming into this. We wanted the machine learning algorithm to be understandable. So the model we trained on a lot of our own data and a lot of customer data initially to see which algorithms would work best based off of all the different uh, algorithms that are out there in the machine learning world. We wanted to find one, but we wanted to, to also have it be where it is uh, adaptive to each customer environment. Since we know that everybody's gonna have a slightly different environment, the model can't be so rigid that it doesn't adapt to everybody's uh, environment individually. Also, we wanted it to be portable. So it had to be able to ship with the product since on-premises products won't always have access to the internet because they might be locked down in some uh, special part of the network. It had to be able to be shipped with the product so it couldn't be uh, too overly complex or need regular updates from the internet in order to function. Uh, likewise, we wanted it to be able to uh, have low impact on the server itself. So since it's running with the database performance analyzer product and other products in our portfolio in the future, we wanted to make sure that it would exist alongside all of those products as they're doing their different uh, work in order to do the monitoring part of the product and not overly interfere with that. So it couldn't be CPU intensive. It could not be memory intensive. It could not otherwise take away from the operation of the system. So basically what the algorithm does is it looks for uh, three components. So we first ran some machine learning algorithms on all of the different data that I mentioned earlier. And the machine learning popped out a model. And not surprisingly, it found that there are three components to almost everybody's data out there. One is an overall trend, which is not surprising. Everybody tends to be getting more busy or less busy. Maybe you make some optimizations that in, improve your database performance and you're generally trending down or you're adding customers continually and your overall trends going up. Next, we found, uh, or the machine, I guess, should found that almost everybody had a weekly seasonal component. That is to say that there was a definite 168 hour uh, frequency to the data where things would happen in that weekly seasonality where it was low on the weekends and high during the weekdays or some uh, variation of that so that almost everybody had this 168 hour cycle. And lastly, not surprising again, was the machine told us that there was a 24 hour cycle. Actually, the machine came back and told us that there was like a 24.8 hour cycle, but uh, we took a look at that and we decided to round down and uh, say that, no, there's probably a 24 hour cycle and the, the math was just slightly off. And so everybody has a 24 hour cycle in that most people have nightly uh, backups and people come into work at 8 a.m. and leave at 5 or some variation of that. And so there was a really strong 24-hour component of that as well. So when you take all of that and you build a model off of that, and the mod model uh, first trains itself on a set of data and then compares itself to the rest of the data to test its validity, what ends up being left over is uh, some noise. So the predictions are never exactly precise. Uh, if they were, we'd be extremely impressed, but there's always a little variation of uh, somebody in marketing running a query that they didn't yesterday or somebody in sales doing something extra on Friday that they weren't doing on Thursday. So there's that type of just extra noise in the database wait time metric. And so with that noise, because we've taken out the trend and the two parts of the seasonality, we end up with uh, statistically a very normal looking set of data. So I apologize if I get a little too 
uh, mathy on anybody, but what we end up with, with that is that traditional bell curve, if you remember from school, the, the Gaussian curve of data, and that noise ends up being very normal. So we're able to calculate normal statistics off of that, and not only is the machine then able to do a fairly accurate prediction based off of the trend in two seasonal components, it is also then able to take that residual noise and calculate a fairly good window around that prediction in order to give some fuzziness to the algorithm so that you don't have to be exact, it just gives you a, a fairly narrow or a fairly wide range depending on how sensitive you want the algorithm to be. And that was great from our perspective because we really wanted to give the users the ability to have that sensitivity in their hands so that if the algorithm got out into the wild and they found that it was too noisy or not noisy enough, they would be able to use that standard deviation in order to make their noise level go up and down and, and really tune it to their environment. So again, we wanted to have that flexibility in the hand of the customer so that they Carlo, you cut out there, right at about when you were talking about in the hands of the customer. Thank you, Leslie. It's always appreciated by all software developers to have some uh, quality assurance out there. So uh, really appreciate that because uh, most developers, we would not survive without QA. Yeah, so it's, we put it in the hands of the customers so that the customers really can have it attuned to their specific environment and that they will be able to then be in control of just uh, how noisy uh, they want it to be. If you want to see every anomaly that's possible, then by all means, this algorithm could be tuned to just tell you all of the anomalies that are going on out there. If you just want to listen to the absolute strangest anomalies that are out there, then it will do that as well. So that is good. I hope that I've convinced you that we're serious about our math at SolarWinds. Uh, but as it comes down to it, uh, that's just not good enough. So there is some machine learning there to, to generate the initial algorithm, but we wanted to go a step further. We wanted to look at some strange data sets that might not work well with that initial methodology. And as we released the first version of DPA with the anomaly detection, uh, there were some friendly customers out there who worked with us and said, hey, you know what, this is great, but it's not uh, working 100% as I'd like it. And we're like, super, thank you very much. We would love to work with you and understand where the uh, models are falling short with specific data sets and see how we can adapt them. So here's where we went the extra mile and we wanted to add even more machine learning into it. So giving the machine even more options to choose from and not just one solid model, but give it multiple models and then allow it to choose and really make us more hands off from a development and rules engine sort of building methodology to say, all right, algorithms, you know what's best. We'll just stand back here and you tell us which of these different options is best. So what the algorithms end up doing is they start to give themselves some feedback. So they'll look at the uh, different al anomalies that are being detected and then it will say, all right, I am seeing an anomaly at this specific cadence. Can I predict an anomaly based off of the cadence that I'm seeing? And if I can predict an anomaly, then that's not an anomaly. So there's algorithms in there that are trying to predict the anomalies. And if they can, then they'll send feedback into uh, the original algorithm saying, hey, I can predict this we need to adapt. And when that message comes into the original algorithms, the original algorithms then go back to the drawing board and say, all right, out of my bag of tricks, out of my bag of algorithms, what can I do that would be better? And so it starts to look at different predictions and different ranges and starts to move its prediction range based off of that feedback. So that's continually learning and continually adjusting based off of the feedback and choosing uh, out of a handful of algorithms in order to say, all right, which one is the best for you? So we started to put this against some of those uh, customer data sets where it wasn't working well. And lo and behold, uh, the machines came back with some surprising things that, that were working better. And it was great because what it was doing was saying, no, sometimes 
uh, spikes are predictable and we can predict when that is and it's not anomalous and we can use this uh, different methodology into finding those spikes or we can find those dips or whatever those different data changes were, the machine was able to tell us when that happened and adjust quickly because of that. So just by having that continual feedback from the algorithms, you're able to have a, another machine learning component jump in and help the initial model actually adapt itself and be facilitated by other models within the system. Okay, so with that, what we're going to do is I'm going to switch over into the product. I'm going to do like a two minute kind of just drive high level overview of the product. Then I'm going to get into showing how we expose the machine learning in the product and have Carlo talk to that. While I'm getting converted over, Carl, why don't, why don't you talk about the uh, some of what we learned that we've now put into the kind of the next generation, the version two while I'm getting set up? Sure. So the the version two that we're looking at is uh, uh, somewhat what I was just describing with the, the autocorrelation and finding the predictability, but it's also looking All right, you cut out on us just just there. Okay. Q, QA again for the win. Yeah. Thanks, <laughs> Leslie. So uh, what, what was going on is that we really wanted to look at the data and we found a couple more ways to, to make some improvements with this B2 just by uh, actually doing some math on the data as it's going into the algorithm. So not only looking at your raw data, but there's uh, some fancy math that you can do in the machine learning world to adapt your data as it goes in. There's things like normalization and standardization and doing things like taking square roots and logarithms of your data. And that, that changes it in a way that actually makes it more easy for these models to intake. So th this V2 is actually well armed with some of these new approaches to come in and look at your environment and be able to transform your data in a way that makes the overall machine learning experience better for you. Okay, great. So uh, what I'm going to do, this is just, uh, I'm going to switch between a couple of versions of DPA. One of the things I, I really want to drive home was when, when you first log on to DPA, uh, you will see that we have kind of your overall view. You can gather, you can create your own groups of databases. So if you want to look at just a specific type of database or specific group of databases, you can customize that. This is kind of our health monitoring screen. To go in and actually set up databases is literally like, I think it's four screens in the wizard to do this. So you can go in, select the database type that you want to, uh, what the product to, to monitor. And you can see we have it broken out between the ones that are on-prem, the ones that would be in AWS, and the ones that would be in uh, Azure. You select it, walk through uh, a couple of uh, screens. You need to put in your login credentials so that it can create credentials for DPA to go in and monitor the database. And John just lost you. So, boy, I tell you, pretty soon it's going to be down to every 30 seconds. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so, you know, one of the things in the beauty of the product is, as I mentioned, you have real-time historical data. You can also go in and create custom reports. The reports are all set up based on the, the type of database that you have. Um, and then once you select a database, then it'll tell you what uh, reports are available. Um, so you can go in and, you know, schedule a report. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of alerting in the product. So if you want to go in and create, uh, you know, custom alerts that you then want to be notified of, you know, certain thresholds being met. Now, this is outside the machine learning. You know, um, you can go in and, and, and create something new and have it, you know, send you an email or, you know, we have a lot of customers that integrate this into, uh, you know, a specific, um, you know, product like Opsgene or something like that. So, you know, very easy to do uh, the customization. If you have virtualized databases, you can literally click on virtualization and it'll list all the, the uh, databases running in a virtual machine. And again, we provide a lot of detailed data uh, from a virtualization perspective. 
but what I really wanted to focus on though was getting into um, you know the 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 machine learning and looking at okay you know when is a problem a problem and one of the things that we have is this tuning um, opportunity here uh, which you know will go in and it will uh, kind of you know for a database instance this will this is where we'll go in and, and give you advice that type of thing but if I just drop into a database and let me choose this one because this one's got a lot of data there uh, you you notice at a high level uh, it used to be we just had this one uh, view here that would literally do a consolidation based on the time because you notice here with the product I can you know pick a specific day uh, date range or you know a time within that uh, day to you know look at data um, but if I want to go in and look at you know something specific and since we are talking about uh, SQL Server uh, let me see I'll choose this one here um, so this is an interesting one because again this is just doing kind of a wait time analysis uh, for a specific time because uh, you know again you can have a consolidated view or look at everything but let's just look for, for for demonstration purposes we'll look at all the time so what gets interesting is this section right here which is the anomaly detection so Carla why don't you t uh, tell us you know based on where we used to just look up here and we used to always look at like the long pole in the tent talk about this anomaly detection and I think the thing that really throws people off is kind of describe the baseline and and why you'll actually sometimes see below you know below the baseline sure so our goal here really was to make sure that people could easily find the anomalies with just a quick glance. We did a lot of UX research. As machine learning specialists, what we're not super great at is coming back with some amazing UI that is intuitive for everybody to use. So fortunately, we have a great UX design team and UX research team at SolarWinds that worked with us in order to find out you know, what would be the easiest thing for users to uh, digest and, and this was the result of that so this wasn't just some random thing that we came up with there a lot of time was spent in coming up with this so how do we interpret this data so obviously red is bad that's pretty standard amongst all of our uh, solar winds monitoring products so red means that there there is an issue so wherever you see red uh, that means that there has been an anomaly we've detected it and what we're doing is changing the status of the database to be in the critical status uh, versus the warning or good status. And what we're seeing here is that horizontal line is essentially the predicted value. And anything that's green around the predicted value is okay. From a anomaly detection perspective, we could go both ways. We could say if you're too high above the prediction, you're an anomaly, or if you're too low below a prediction, you're an anomaly. Uh, because this is database wait time, uh, too low is not a bad thing. Now, you might argue with me that if it's too low, that means that something's wrong with the system in general, and I agree. But it's not a problem with your database. If your, da if your wait time's too low, it's probably because you're not sending it, it queries. And that's not a problem with the database. That's likely a problem with your... Uh, website or your application that's executing the uh, queries. So the problem's not with your database. So we don't want to throw up a, a, a red flag saying, hey, there's a problem with the database when in fact it's a problem with your application or something like that. So everything below the line is generally going to be green. But what you can see is that as things are below the line, that means it's below the prediction. And the range of those bars show that within that time period, the range went all the way from you know, below the bar green all the way up to above the bar red in those uh, first few cases. You can also see a little bit of yellow. So depending on the size of the standard deviation within the residuals that we showed earlier, uh, determines the size of that yellow bar. And so what we're essentially seeing here is that there's a pretty narrow standard deviation in this specific database because in general, it's got fairly low utilization there's not a lot of wait time going on here, so there's not a lot of variability. So suddenly when we see those big spikes, uh, we're seeing a lot of red because 
it's a fairly sensitive threshold based off of the history of that specific metric. And Carl, you know, one of the things that, that uh, customers really love is like, again, if I didn't have this anomaly detection down here, I would be looking at this and I go, oh, okay, here's my problem. Look, look at all this wait time that we incurred, you know, during this 11 o'clock hour, right? That's my problem. But once I, the machine learning comes and says, you know what, actually, it's, <laughs> That's better than usual, right? So this is this is really not a problem. But when I look over here, this looks fine to the naked eye. But now this is saying no, you you really deviated uh, into uh, you know a critical stage. Or exactly, exactly. So that's the beauty of understanding the seasonality and the trends is that it's taking into consideration every single hour of your day and evaluating it individually and putting that alongside with the overall trend of your data and where your data is going. And so typically at that point of the day, there's, and, and that day of the week, there's, there's no wait time whatsoever or very low wait time. And then you're suddenly using something that's beyond normal. So that's anomalous. And so, uh, yeah, that's what we were going for is spikes aren't always bad. Spikes are normal. It's something that's deviating away from the normal or away from the prediction that we really wanted to show. Cool, and, and I'll add one last thing. So if any of y'all have uh, some questions you'd like to ask us, uh, Leslie, I've got up the chat, so I don't know if I guess would I see the uh, chat questions or would they be under it's, questions? It's questions, yeah. So okay. there is so, yeah. one there about polling interval um, and, and somebody had mentioned they used this tool before and that it used to be at 10 minutes and was wondering if that's going to change with the new version. So the polling, the way it works is that it pulls every second and then rolls up every 10 minutes. So what you end up storing in the database is 10 minute intervals. And so the, the data is pulled every second, but then is aggregated into 10 minute buckets. So you're getting the level of detail down to the second and that detail is, is available. But then what ends up being rolled up to the database is uh, the 10 minute buckets. The 10 minute buckets, uh, are what we evaluate the anomaly detection against. So the, the one second piece of it is important because we're getting the aggregations of the wait times every second for the entire 10 minute bucket. So you think it's a 10 minute pulling interval, but it's not. It's actually the aggregation of all of those wait times for every second in that 10 minute bucket. And then based off of that 10 minute bucket, and we do some uh, smart math for smoothing that out with the, the previous five buckets that we found, and we compare that to what the prediction is for the hour, then that's how we do the anomaly detection. So a little bit beyond what you're asking, uh, but uh, that's, you know, when you look at the 10 minute storage, it's not just 10 minutes, it's, it's an aggregation of that down to the second polling. And that means that you will end up with data that is longer than 60 seconds times 10 minutes. You'll end up with more than 600 seconds potentially of wait time in a given 10 minute bucket because of multiple processors and multiple queries running simultaneously. You might have 10 queries running simultaneously and they'll all have a second of wait time. So in one second, you could have 10 seconds of wait time. Okay. Well, any any other questions? Not at this point in time. I'll give everybody, oh, we got one. Regarding the anomalies, does DPA give any recommendation and what are those? So out of the box, the, the algorithm is tuned with some defaults. So the uh, the algorithm starts working after three days worth of historical data for it to learn off of and it starts making predictions after that. And default out of the box, the residual standard deviation thresholds are two and three standard deviations. And fortunately for us at SolarWinds, those two and three standard deviations uh, work well for most of our customers. And we know that because you have an option in most of the SolarWinds products to uh, let us learn from you. So sending back anonymous data to the SolarWinds servers so that we're able to look at what you're doing and 
and continually learn from our customer environments and uh, hundreds or I think it's even thousands of DPA customers are sending us back their anonymous data and we get to look and see what they're doing with that data and what they're doing to the threshold specifically. So are they changing those two and three standard deviation defaults out of the box to make the algorithm more sensitive or less sensitive? And what we're finding is customers aren't changing it. They're leaving it at that two and three standard deviation threshold because it's just the right amount of noise. Now, there are definitely customers who have changed it, but they haven't been universally changing it to, you know, bigger standard deviation values or lower standard deviation values. There's just a generalness of people, some people changing it to be a little bit higher or a little bit lower, but the vast majority are leaving it at the defaults. So out of the box, we, we're, we're pretty confident with what we're sending out. That's fantastic. Carlo, thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed, you, especially that discussion of where you were talking about the difference between mach machine learning and predictive analytics. Um, that that was fantastic, um, and and your product does so much. It's it's really amazing. I know it's it's helped several of of my my pre existing clients. Um, so appreciate you both being here, um, and thank you very much for your sponsorship. Um, we had a good crowd. If anybody else has any questions, let me know, um, and we can always get those over to Carlo and John also. For next month, we do have Glenn Berry up. He's going to be doing a uh, tool selection, tool hardware selection for OLTP, section, uh, OLTP systems. Uh, so hopefully you'll join us next month. Um, Carlo, John, thank you so much again. Um, really good stuff. Very interesting yeah. how you approach this. Um, Thanks, Leslie. Thank and, you. And we will, we will talk to soon, and everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.